I want to start today by telling you about three experiences I had all over the course of one week last April. This is a really stressful time for our family. Uh, We were going through a serious medical situation with our oldest son, Cole. He was finishing his uh, first year of college over at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. And uh, he called us one weekend and said, hey, my knee is really, really big. My leg is red, and they're taking me into the hospital. And they're telling me that they're going to have to open up my leg and clean out an infection. And as soon as we heard that, Elise, like the really great mom that she is, she jumped on a plane and she got there and she was there for that first surgery. And she happened to be there for another four or five days where Cole would have three more surgeries where they were opening up his leg, filleting it open. It was just a terrible, disgusting thing and cleaning out a very severe strep infection that was inside of his body. And if you know anything about infections in the body, strep is one of the worst ones that you can get. It's aggressive. It moves up. Your body moves towards your heart. It kills tissue. It's just, it's really disruptive and really, it's very life-threatening. And um, so he's having these surgeries and there's a sense that, that they have a, they're ahead of, of this infection and everything is somewhat serious, but pretty good. Well, Thursday of that week, after his third surgery, the, the chief surgeon called me and he said, Brian, you need to get out here because there's signs that the infection is spreading and it's moving up Cole's legs and up his leg, and we're going to have to move to life-saving and limb-saving measures, and you need to be here. And um, so I did what I could and got on a plane, and um, this whole time, Elise is there by herself, and she's doing her best to uh, help make decisions. She's doing the best to help Cole understand what's happening, listening to the doctors, trying to communicate over the phone back to me. It was just a heavy burden that she was carrying. And so I got there on a Thursday night and she was waiting for me outside of the hospital. And as soon as I saw her, I put my arms around her. She began to weep and she began to shake. And I could just tell that my wife was just tired and weak. She was wary of this heavy burden that she had had to carry sort of on her own over these four days, just emotionally tired, spiritually tired. And she, of course, was afraid, and we were all worried about what's taking place, but I knew that she was just physically exhausted. She had spent every night in the hospital, which means you don't really sleep. And that night, um, just because I was able to be there, she was able to go to the hotel and get a good night's sleep and get a shower for the first time in several days. And when she came back to the hospital the next morning, I could just tell that she had new energy that uh, she needed rest. My wife needed physical rest because of all the emotional and spiritual um, worry that she, she was going through. So that's the first experience. The second experience happened that same night. So I'm staying the night in the hospital and, and Cole is there. And um, I can just tell that Cole's in a bad place. I could tell right away. He was really, really discouraged because he had just heard this terrible news from the doctor that they may remove his leg. And so he's beginning to think about what life might be like if that were to happen. And my son Cole, he's, um, he's very black and white. He's very logical. He's very disciplined in his thinking. But I could tell that there was none of that anymore, that he was just beginning to lose hope. And he was full of despair. And the way I describe his, his, his spirit that night was indignant hopelessness. He was angry, he was frustrated, he didn't know why this was happening, and I could just see hopelessness in my son's eyes for the first time in his entire life. I've never seen it before. And I, uh, when we were alone, I I said to Cole that night, I said, hey buddy, you gotta find it in you to keep fighting. You can't give up here. You have to find it in you, your spirit and your soul. You have to let God bring life to your spirit here because you're needed to fight this infection off. All of this stuff, all of the, the, the medical things that were plugged into him, all the surgeries, all the medicine that, that was in his body, I said, these things are important and they are going to help, but they are not enough. You have to find it in you to fight off this infection. And what was amazing, it just took Cole a night's sleep and he woke up the next morning determined to beat this infection, which he did. And it took everyone. It took all of your prayers. This church was praying, thousands of people all over the world. It took the doctors, but it took Cole and the Holy Spirit bringing life to his spirit in that moment to fight that off. So that's the second experience. The third one actually happened to me a few days later. So at this point, I had been to, at the hospital for seven or eight days. Elise was there for a total of 15 days. I was there for 10. And we had a number of people constantly checking in on us, mostly worried about Cole, but they would check in on Elise and I and see how we were doing. And a buddy of mine sent me a text. He said, how you doing? And I responded with those very profound words, fine. (laughs) Which fine means, if you hear it from a man, it means that he has no idea how he's doing and he really doesn't want to think about how he's doing. That's what fine means, okay? 
Well, he knew that. And he said, no, no, how are you doing really? And how are you doing physically? And that just triggered something in my mind that over the last several days, I had noticed that my heart felt like it was beating out of my chest and my heart rate was really high. And I knew it was very, very unhealthy and perhaps scary. And um, I knew it was the stress and the anxiety kind of overwhelming my body. And so I shared that with him. And, and he reminded me something that he had to do a few years before when he spent the better part of two months in a hospital when his premature sons were born. He said, when I have a chance, I go home and I work out as hard as I can to burn up that energy, that stress and anxiety. And so the first chance I had, I went back to the hotel and I got on a treadmill and I ran as far and as hard as I could. And I can tell you that I ran like 90 miles. <laughs> no, not at all. As far as I could, as hard as I could means I ran for about 10 minutes. I'd be a disgrace to many of you runners in the room. But guess what? It helped. And I did it again the next day and I did it again the next day. We were all under serious stress and trauma and it was affecting every part of our lives. Those two weeks were not normal. The intensity was not normal. The fear was overwhelming and the weight of all the decisions and, and the worry were taking its toll on us, mind, body, and soul, all three of us. And it's impossible in those moments to separate your body from your soul or from your mind to say, I just need to think uh, logically or all we need to do is pray or all I need to do is just rely on this physical medicine to make me better. We're very aware in those moments that we are an integrated being, mind, body, and soul. And every part of us, when it's suffering or when we're suffering or we're struggling, every part of us is affected. Now we're in a series called Flourish that they may have life. And it comes right out of the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, where he says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. The life that Jesus desires for us is flourishing mind, body, and soul. It's not just spiritual flourishing. It's not just spiritual life. He cares about every aspect of our lives. We are people, mind, body, and soul created for love. If you ever get the question from a young person or a kid, uh, what does it mean to be human? Don't answer that, well, you have flesh and blood, you're a homo sapien, blah, blah, blah. Don't do all that. Just say, you know what, who you are? You're someone that has a mind, body, and soul. You're created with a mind, body, and soul, and you are made for love. That's what it means to be human. We all are a combination of parts that add up to something greater than those parts that we call a person. Pete Scazzaro, in his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, says, God made us as whole people. In his image, and the image, this image includes physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and social dimensions. Andy Crouch, in his book, The Life We're Looking For, says a person is a mind-body-soul complex made for love. A human person is not a mind without a heart. You're not a brain without a body. You're not a body without a soul. Nor were you ever meant to be a soul without a body. You are all of these together and in a complex of qualities that makes you a person. That's what makes a person, the combination of those things. And so to say that our, we are integrated beings is, is an understatement. There is a unity inside of us, mind, body, and soul. You are complex and you're more than just flesh and blood. You're more than just neuro uh, pathways and neurons firing in your brain. You're much more than all of those things. And let me make the point two different ways. The first, um, how we often separate the spiritual from the emotional, but we are not meant to be. Those two things are not meant to be uh, separated. So today it's really common in churches, even churches just like ours, to have people who are very familiar with churchy things, religious things. You've been in a church your whole life. Maybe you've listened to hundreds or thousands of sermons and you know the scriptures, you have them memorized and you just, you just know a lot about God, you know a lot about the Bible. And there is a risk to look at that person or to look at yourself if you're that person and say, I am spiritually mature because I know a lot. Or the reason there's a risk of doing that and that is misleading is because the true test of spiritual maturity is our ability to love, to love others, to love our enemies, to love when it's difficult. And so it is impossible to be spiritually mature and be emotionally immature. So there are a lot of people like spend a lot of time in churches, but they have no lasting relationships. They have a hard time forgiving. They remain bitter. The only long lasting relationships they have are the ones that are obligatory that they have to have. Maybe they're related to someone. So you got to stay connected. You don't get to choose your family. 
You can't separate spiritual health or spiritual maturity from emotional health or emotional maturity. They're meant to be joined together because we are mind, body, soul creations. Here's another example that I think is, it's actually really encouraging that the outside world, uh, meaning the secular world, is talking about this. We all know that we are in a mental health crisis, primarily with young people. Um, I think it's great that, that people are, are much more willing to see a therapist or a counselor and to work on those issues in talk therapy. It's very important. That time is precious. It's, it's a time where someone else that's safe can, can share back to you what they're hearing you share you share. They help you sort through things. If they're a really, really good counselor, they're kind of leading you towards truth. Um, They're also trying to help you understand your past and how your past is playing out in in your current thoughts and your current moments. But talk therapy is not enough. And you know who's the first to say that? Counselors. They're the first to tell their clients that this is not enough. They'll say things like, hey, you need to be a part of some kind of community that values the same things. Maybe, even though you're not a religious person, maybe, this is coming a lot of times from secular counselors, maybe you need to go to a church because I heard those communities are good for your mental health. Things like getting together for a long meal with somebody else can help you. Certainly medicine can be a part of that equation, but there are many, many other things. Um, I think it was in the Atlantic Magazine, there was a whole article about how prayer, prayer, Praying to God is one of the most helpful things for people who are dealing with anxiety and depression. The point is this, that the world is discovering more and more that we are mind, body, soul creations made for more than just existing and winning and trying to survive. We are integrated. It's important to see that. So as a church, over the next couple of years, you know, during the series, we're sharing big ideas that are going to show up over and over again here at Cornerstone the next few years in all of our ministries. This is one of the big ideas. That to flourish, we need a flourishing that is complete mind, body, and soul. Because God cares about all of those things. And the Spirit can bring healing to all of them. So saying that, I want to take you to a flourishing passage today. And I want you to see where we come up with this definition of what it means to be human. And this is one of the very first flourishing passages in all of the Bible. It occurs in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's the context. Israel has been living as slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. God has delivered them. It's the story of the Exodus and Moses. And uh, now God has the task of trying to form this group of people, this mass of people, into a cohesive community that mirrors his heart to the world, but also allows them to flourish as a people, as families, and as individuals. And so he doesn't, doesn't leave them on their own. God begins to give them instructions about life. And so in Deut- Deuteronomy chapter five, the chapter right before what we're gonna read, he gives them the 10 commandments. Like these are things that lead to flourishing in life. There's never been a better list ever given. But then you get to Deuteronomy chapter six, and the whole thing gets summed up this way. This is what it says. These are the commands decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you And that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God of your ancestors promised you. So I hope you heard the flourishing language there. To enjoy life, to have long life, that it would go well with you, that they might increase. That's flourishing language. God's command is meant to help an entire people flourish together all at once. Then you get to verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your homes and on your gates. And it goes on and on as if to say this is so important that you need reminders, we need reminders everywhere in life that the thing that God asks for first before worship and service and care for others and meaningful, beautiful work that that helps the world be a better place, God asks for your love. Isn't that amazing? 
And you compare it to all the other religious narratives that existed at this time or even existed or that now exist that came about later on. There's nothing like this. That a God that talks about loving his people and what he asks from them is love in return. It's amazing. I often think of it this way. God says to us, I want all of you for all of me. Or he might say it this way. He has given us all of himself and what he wants in return is all of us. You're called to love him, mind, body, and soul. And this is a love that's more than affection. It's more than commitment. It's more than uh, even wanting something good for someone else. It certainly is all of those things, but it's more encompassing than that. It's all of me. It's all of you for all of him. Now, by the way, his love is not conditional. He is not waiting for us to give him all of ourselves. He has already given us all of himself. But what he asks for is a lot. And let me show you. Let me show you these three words that show up. The first, the first is heart, and then there's soul, and there's strength here in this passage. The Hebrew word for heart is the Hebrew word lebab, which means the inner life of a person, the inner man or the inner woman. It's your conscience. It's your, your mind. It's your heart. It's that center. It's the way we think. And so this is just a way to describe that part of us that's more than just flesh and blood. That's your heart. Then he says the soul, and the soul is the Hebrew word nefesh, and nefesh often is used to describe the part of you that carries your desires and emotions, but more often than not, nefesh describes your very breath, your life. So your whole life, your very essence, the reason, uh, your ability to take a breath, that is your soul or nefesh. And then the third word here is mayot, and it's the word that translates in our Bible to strength. This is your physical might, your power, your force, but it literally translates to this. Listen, you're exceedingly, you're extra. If you're on one of my sports teams, you would hear me say you're dunamis. Like the little bit inside, the little bit extra, your power, your determination, the extra part of you. So here is what the Lord is saying. He wants all of us, like our faculties, our will, our conscience, our heart. He wants every breath, and he wants all of our passion. I mean, it's a big ask. But I told you, all of him for all of you, or all of him for all of me. All that we are, every second of every day, for as long as we live, with all that we have. Amazing passage. What he wants is love. You are a mind, body, soul, creation made for love. Now, Jesus knew this. And Jesus isn't the only one that pulled out this passage to build on it and to help people understand what God is after. But in Mark chapter 12, it's an amazing, amazing little section. You go down to, you know, verse 25, this conversation takes place. Jesus is talking to his his crowd and his disciples and the Pharisees are there. And the religious leaders are jealous of Jesus. And so they're trying to catch him um, by getting him to to share some teaching that is not true. And so they're trying to catch him like, what is the most important of all the commands? And there's something like 66 different commands in the Hebrew scriptures, not just 10. So they're trying to catch Jesus. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, but he adds a word. At least Mark tells us that he does. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So this is what Jesus is adding here, your mind and your strength. So if you wanted to build a bigger list of what it means to be a person, you can now add the mind in there. This is the part of you that has a capacity for reflection and learning and understanding. So Jesus is making even bigger. God wants all of you, all of me, all the time with all that we have. All of him for all of you. So Moses is trying to communicate this. Jesus is trying to communicate. He's like, hey, it's more than just religious devotion. It's more than just doing the right thing. What God is after is a loving connection with all of you as a person. Now, this theme of trying to connect to the deeper parts of a person continues in the Bible. So one example of that is in Psalm 139. A lot of you love this passage. It's one of those great affirmation passages about the way God sees you and loves you. Like if you struggle with your self-image, read Psalm 139 every day. It's a great exercise. It's the psalm that starts off this way. You have searched me, Lord, and know me. So you remember that, right? You know when I sit and when I stand. But you get to verse 13. Listen how David is describing himself and what God sees in him and what God loves about him. For you created my inmost being. In verse 15, he says, my frame was not hidden from you. My physical frame, he's describing his body. 
Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. Verse 23, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See, David knows something as um, just a very, very old person from antiquity that we need to understand today, and that is that we are mind, body, soul creations made for love. He understands something that modern people don't. That all of us was made for him. And that we flourish when all of us, all of ourselves, every part of us is put into his care. All right, for sake of language, here at Cornerstone, we're using the three words, mind, body, soul, to describe the type of flourishing that we are after here. So I want to be really clear what I mean and what we mean as a church when we talk about these things. So first is your mind that God has created inside of you. He has filled you with a mind. So your mind includes your will, your thoughts, your intelligence, your logic. This is where you hold your memories. It's the tiny executive center of a person. It's the part of you that is capable of reflection and learning and understanding. And your mind is incredible. It's able to imagine wonders and bring them into being. It's able to communicate with language and ponder the deep meanings of life, including AI. (laughs) Your mind is an incredible thing. It was made for him. You also have a body. Your body is your physical frame, as described in Psalm 139. Flesh and bone, blood and organs, muscle and senses all together. Dallas Willard, in his book, The Renovation of the Heart, says the body is the focal point of your presence in the physical and social world. This is a physical world. It's not a disembodied world. And you have a body to live in it, to interact with him and to interact with others. Your body allows you to move and to build and to work and to generate power and to grow and to multiply. And the human body is a beautiful thing despite the fact that all of our bodies are failing and fading. So we all have fading bodies. Mine seems to be just dropping everywhere. But did you know that God has a plan for our physical bodies? To restore it, to resurrect it? Romans chapter eight, listen to this. You can't tell me God doesn't care about physical things. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead will also give life to your, look what he's saying, mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. He will bring life to your mortal bodies. The spirit brings life to the body and the body lives on. If you ever wonder what it'll be like to see your loved ones in heaven, you will recognize them. They will be there in their frame, a glorified frame, be it, but you will recognize them. They'll recognize you. So that's what we mean by the body. And then lastly, the soul. This is the inner room where your true essence is found. It's where your emotions, your desires, your insecurities, your wounds, they all live here in some jumbled mess that God needs to sort out. In that same book, Dallas Willard says, the soul is the dimension of, that per- of a, the person that interrelates all of the other dimensions so that they form one life. The soul encompasses and organizes the whole person. So let me say a little bit more about the soul because it can be confusing for people. Um, the way I'm, we're describing school, the soul is often the way we describe the heart, like the center of a person. So in Psalm 42, David is talking about the center place can see as a deer pants for streams of water my soul pants for you my soul thirsts but it was his father in proverbs chapter 4 that was using the metaphor of more of a heart he's sharing this with david pay attention to these decrees what are some of those decrees will love the lord your god all your heart soul mind and strength that's the first one he said do not let them out of your sight keep them within your heart your heart is where you hide the deep things of life Look what it says. It will bring health to one's whole body. Hmm. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows out of it. So we don't really care if you call it your heart, your soul. We're all kind of describing the same thing. And what happens in the soul is special. So Teresa of Avila, who was a... uh, a Carmelite nun that lived in Spain 500 years ago. She was trying to help people understand that you're more than flesh and blood. And she's trying to help people understand that we all have a soul. And she said, imagine it this way, that inside of you, there is this beautiful mansion or castle. 
And that's what makes up your soul. And as you descend further and further into the center of the castle, it gets more beautiful and pure and lovely. And then there is this room inside of that castle that represents your soul. And it's in that place that your spirit lives. And it's in that place where God's spirit meets your spirit and brings it to life. It's the ultimate sanctuary in the world. I mean, there are beautiful buildings all over Europe, but what's taking place inside of your soul when you commune with God, it's immeasurable. Maybe someday we'll get to see it. But the soul is the sanctuary where his spirit meets our spirit and special things happen there. That's where we were reborn and made new and changed. So that's what we mean when we talk about mind, body, and soul. And when we work with your kids, for example, who are struggling with mental health, We will not neglect their spiritual life and taking care of their soul. But we also want them to know that there might be things physically that can help them flourish. There might be things mentally that can help them flourish. And as a church, we're pursuing flourishing in all of these areas. All right, I want to talk for a moment, spend a few seconds talking about what happens when we separate these parts of us because the consequences are dire. Nancy Piercy in a great book called Love Thy Body, she says, in the purpose-driven view of creation, there is no dichotomy between the body and a person. The two together form an integrated psychophysical unity. We respect and honor our bodies as part of the revelation of God's purposes in our lives, meaning your body as purpose is part of the created order that is declaring the glory of God. She's warning, don't separate the two. Well, let me tell you a few places where this gets separated today. How about the hookup culture that's very popular with uh, teenagers and young adults? Anyone old enough to not even know the phrase hookup culture? Raise your hand so we can honor you. Oh, awesome. If you young enough to not know, I'm so glad you guys don't know it. Okay. The hookup culture is an ugly thing. It basically is sex without commitment. It's sex without care. It's sex without consequence. Can be casually with a friend or a stranger. And it comes from the idea that the physical is completely separate from the emotional. And sex simply is two bodies getting together. It's like adult playtime. And there is no consequence and it is harmless to the rest of you. In that book, Love Thy Body, uh, Nancy Piercy just describes a conversation she had with one of her students. Student's name was Alicia. She described it this way. Hookups are very scripted. You learn to turn everything off except your body. You make yourself emotionally invulnerable. Now, I can tell you that that idea, or you might say lie from Satan, has been harming young people for a very, very long time. Because sex is a physical picture of what's meant to be, uh, it's a physical picture of what happens spiritually and emotionally in marriage. It's beautiful. It's the idea of all of me for all of you to this other person. And when we separate the emotional or the mental or the spiritual from sex, we're left with something that ends up harming us. Here's another example. This is one that happens in churches all the time. So, um, Let me give you a little church history. In the first and second century, there was this really big heresy that the church was dealing with called Gnosticism. And don't have time to describe it. In fact, it's super boring, but I will say this. Gnosticism taught this, that the spirit is more important than the physical. That your spiritual life is more important than your physical life. That prayer is more important than your work. That worship is more important than your family. That heaven, this distant place, is more important than earth. When if you just read the Bible, that you see someday heaven and earth come together and God refines the earth and makes heaven here again. It's like, it's just, it's, a, it's a full of a bunch of bad ideas, but it left a bunch of good-hearted Christians believing things like, hey, my body doesn't matter, caring for the planet doesn't matter, my work doesn't matter. They were even uncomfortable with the thought that Jesus had a body and that he suffered and died. Why? Because... He endured something physically. So that, um, that heresy was dealt with long ago, but it still lives on today. There are a lot of people, a lot of us at times, think God only cares about the spiritual. You think that this is his most important hour, at least when he thinks about you in your week. 
But today with your family is important to him. The way you Sabbath is important to him. The way you work is important to him. The way you begin your day and end your day is important to him. So what happens in Gnosticism, even modern day, is that we separate the spiritual from all the other things and say the spiritual is better or more important. Has dire consequences. Your faith will not make sense if you do that. Here's another example, okay? And this is not meant to be controversial, but it's something that many people are dealing with today, and it has to do with being, what's being shared with our children today regarding sex and gender. Here's the idea that the world is now sharing, which is a new idea, and it's this, that you can separate your gender from your physical body. It goes like this, that your gender is a social construct. You can identify with something different than your physical body or your sex that's given to you at birth. Unfortunately, what this is de- doing is denying God's good creation in you, that our gender has purpose and meaning and that God chooses our gender for a reason. All of this happened really quickly. Today we have parents, they, their kids come back from school as early as kindergarten, and the kids come in and say, Mommy, the teacher told me just because I have girl parts doesn't mean I'm a girl. And the kid is very, very confused. What's happening? We are separating the mind from the body. In a BBC documentary, they summed up this whole movement this way. It says that the heart of this debate is an idea that your mind can be at war with your body. In that war, the mind wins. It is not true. Now, there's lots of compassion for people who are dealing with this, but the answer is not to affirm something that is not true. Right now, America is leaning into this issue. We're like, all in. We should pay attention to what's happening in Western European nations who are ahead of us, more progressive than us on this issue. They are now walking back many of their policies because they have discovered that when these adolescents who are allowed to take hormones or have sex changes to become adults, they realize, I was way too young to make those decisions, and I actually don't identify with the other gender. But what's happened? They've altered their body. And they can't go back. Here's common sense. Young people, including teenagers, every one of us in this room, struggle to form an identity. It's the identity forming years, isn't it? We try on different things. And so you work with a kid during that time. But to make permanent decisions that affect them the rest of their life is not just immature. It's actually a very evil idea. And there's a reason the movement is going the other direction now. I say all that to say that there is room in this church for people dealing with those things. We have people dealing with those things. But you need to know that there are some ideas that are not helpful and separating your mind from your body is one that will not lead to joy and flourishing. That might be hard work to work through that, but there are other alternatives. And we have experts here that can help and we're trying to help our parents with all of those things. I could, I could spend all day talking about that subject, but we don't have time. <laughs> I do want to... Um, Bring us back to the idea, though, of love. So there, there is danger when we separate parts of us. There's also danger when we separate our lives from love. We are meant for loving relationship with God. We saw that a moment ago. Um, but we are meant for love with other people. So Jesus, when he was talking and referring to Deuteronomy chapter 6, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he goes on to say this. You know the verse, verse 31. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Joy and flourishing is found in relationships, meaningful relationships, vulnerable relationships, available relationships, relationships where trust is broken and trust is rebuilt, real life relationships. The modern world is a really hard place to be human and I think this is one of the reasons why we now have devices and opportunities of connection. There are pseudo connections. So social media appeals to this part of us, like to stay connected with someone, to be seen by someone, to be respected by someone, but there is no real commitment. And so we're settling for these other things, and we're, what we're seeking is love and connection, and we're settling for something that is a version of that that doesn't lead to flourishing. And the best way I can say it is by sharing you, with you an Andy Crouch quote. So Andy Crouch wrote that book I mentioned a moment ago, The Life We're Looking For. But he says it this way. None of us were born looking for a screen. We were all born looking for a face. And isn't that true? 
when you die, you will not look for a screen. You'll be looking for his face, Jesus. The only one that knows the way through the grave of death or the wilderness of death, you will be looking for a face. Why is it that in between those places, we settle for screens rather than faces? It's no coincidence, scriptures say over and over again, seek the face of God. Picture his face. Think of him. Move towards others. See their face. Because, why? Because God cares about our flourishing more than we ever could. All right, saying all that, I want you to hear from um, someone really, really special. She happens to be the most famous person in the room. She will not tell you that. But Dr. Jill Carnahan is a world-renowned uh, re renowned doctor. Her, her waiting list just to see her is over four years. She's a functional medicine expert. She's duly board certified, and she's the founder and medical director of the Flatirons Functional Medicine. Uh, she, she's amazing. She's also a part of this church, and she has been helping people deal with mind, body, soul issues for a number of years, and she has her own incredible story. So as she comes up, we're going to show you a trailer of a new documentary that, that her and some, some others have produced, and it's coming out, in the, I think, in the next month. And so you can watch this as Dr. Jill comes on up. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> She saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. All right, let's give Dr. Jill a, a welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for being here, but you're often here, but thank you for being on stage. It's a different view. Yes. Um, your story is amazing. You've gone through so many ups and downs and suffering of your own, but, and you've learned a lot about flourishing from that. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about your story? Sure. So by God's grace, I was born to overcome and not only to overcome, but my soul's journey has been to experience sometimes great suffering in order that I might learn at a level that I can help you all and other people to overcome as well. I grew up on a farm in central Illinois. I was one of five children. My mother was a nurse, and then she retri retired to take care of all of us. And I grew up with a beautiful family of faith and nurturing and just an incredible situation. But unbeknownst to me the chemicals on that farm were slowly killing me. And I went to medical school, and at 25 years old, I was in my surgical rotation, and I found a lump in my breast. Now, we're taught that 25-year-olds don't get cancer, so initially I wasn't too concerned. But I did as I was told, and I saw a radiologist, and I had a biopsy, and it wasn't very long that I found out that I had a very aggressive breast cancer. And I know I'm not unique in my suffering. Every one of you has a story. And we all remember those moments where we got a phone call telling us that someone we loved was dead or that we got a life-threatening diagnosis ourselves. Or maybe it was a son or daughter who had, you know, done something very difficult in our lives or any number of financial crisis. And usually we have these distinct memories of the, so the songs that were playing on the radio at that time. And the, the, I remember the color of the chair when my oncologist called me and said, Jill, you have aggressive breast cancer. 
And those are pivotal moments in our lives where we have a choice. And we have the choice to go deep and to wrestle with the suffering. For me, it was within two weeks of my diagnosis, I was driving in the car with my ex-husband. And I heard a pastor on the radio. And he was talking about Lazarus. And he spoke John eleven four. And this shot me to the heart. I'll never forget that moment. And he said, this sickness will not end in death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And in that moment, I knew that was my first illness. And I knew I was, number one, I was going to live. From that moment forward, I never once wondered if I was going to die. I knew that God had promised. But the other part of that promise is the sickness will not end in death, but it's for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And at that moment, I started to search in the illness, in the suffering. I had no hair. I had skin rashes. I was so sick from the chemo. I was down to my lowest weight since like 10 years old. And I was suffering. But I knew that God had promised me life if I would bring him glory. And I had no idea that that was the first of many illnesses that would frame my entire calling and my whole career. And this week I was reading in Genesis 32, and I read about Jacob who was going to visit his brother Esau with a great gift with his wives and concubines, and he left them at a fjord and said, go ahead, and I'm going to stay here for the night. And over that night, he met an unwanted stranger. And we can consider these sufferings, these difficulties, these illnesses that we're dealing with are unwanted strangers. Why we never ask for them? It turned out to be an angel, and he wrestled that angel that night pinned him down and said, I want you to bless me. And I love this. Literally this week, I thought this is such a great analogy for our suffering. Like that unwanted stranger, if we can pin it down and say, God, how can you bless me through this? Because it's when we go to that left, when we get out of our head as the mind, body, spirit that Brian suggested, I was in my head completely before the age of 40 when I had to really go down into my soul and my heart and my body and really experience what it feels like. So it's in these times, and then I, six months later, passed out in the emergency room, woke up with surgery, emergency surgery, and was told I had Crohn's disease, and then I ended up having severe mold-related illness after the flood here in Boulder. But in each of these unwanted strangers, I was able to find the blessing, and God has transformed every bit of that and given me health and healing so that I can share that with all of you and with the world. Out in the lobby... um Jill's brought her book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith. And um, one of the themes I loved in it is how you talk about love and how love is necessary and essential in flourishing, but also in healing physically. And can you tell us more about that? Sure. So I realized, and even in making the documentary, that at the core of healing, I grew up in a family where it's all about loving others and giving to others and serving others. And that is this wonderful calling we have as Christians. But at a deeper level, if we don't love ourselves, if we don't love all the parts of ourselves, if we don't see ourselves as God sees us, which is perfect daughter of Christ because of Jesus' blood, if we don't have that love for our own body and cells, we develop illness. And so I learned a hard lesson, but a beautiful lesson that at the core, you must accept and love all parts of yourself before you can love others. And so that social connection and unconditional love is absolutely the foundation of healing. There are um, a number of people in our faith community here, our congregation, that are struggling with mental illness, anxiety, depression, loneliness. Um, it's, of course, it's happening in our community as well. I know you have a lot of really helpful things to say just about some of the root causes of those things that might surprise some people, but also some other steps that they can take um, besides maybe just talk therapy or medicine, which those things are certainly helpful, but there's some other things that people can think about that will help. Can you share some about that? Yes, and I want to frame this too. There is nothing wrong with medication. There's nothing wrong with physicians and all of these other things. We're just saying what else is possible, right? And so in saying that, number one, we got to say as a functional medicine expert, what is the root cause? And sometimes it's surprising. In functional medicine, we often look at infectious burden and toxic load. And these are things you may not have even thought about. Could there be an infection that's driving inflammation and dysfunction in my brain and leading to depression or anxiety? Could there be toxins like water damage to my home and mold? I told this in the first service, but I have a good friend whose house 
had mold issues. She and her daughter came to see me. And when I'm talking to them about the history of the home, we found out there were two homicides and a suicide in that house. And it was full of toxic, black, stacky batteries. And there's a darkness and depression that comes over people when they get exposed to mold. So could it be that there's actually something else other than just the mood that's going on? And that, as a functionist and doctor, is what we like to do is go to that root cause. Because those things, those toxins, those infections, those inflammatory conditions can affect the brain as well as the body. So what do we do about it? I'm going to give you seven very practical steps as quick as I can. Number one, physical activity, sunshine, getting daylight in your eyes as soon as possible with the rising of the sun will actually help your sleep, will help your mood, will help those neurotransmitters to optimize. Physical activity, getting out in nature, putting away your cell phones and your devices. Um, there is absolute associations with depression and anxiety in the amount of time you spend on your devices. So what I do is turn off all the notifications so that I can go to the phone when I want to, but it never calls me out of my life. Second, sleep, absolutely critical. There is a high association with depression and anxiety and insomnia and hypersomnia, which means either too much sleep or too little sleep. So if you're not sleeping, that's a great place to start. Last weekend, I talked to a dear friend who was suffering from dark depression. And the very first thing we talked about was, when are you going to bed? How are you sleeping? And I gave him tips on how to sleep better because I knew that was at the core of some of the mood issues. So sleep, physical activity, food. Um, often we're eating fast food, processed food, and all of these chemicals, these trans fats, these altered uh, things that aren't really food to begin with are actually affecting our brain and inflammation. We need healthy fats like olive oil and fish oil in order for our brains to function. So these are crucial, and that's food. Stress. Who of us doesn't have stress, right? Hans Selye, with his research, talked about an acronym called NUTS. These are the predictors of stress in our life, and they stand for novelty, new, new things, unpredictability, threat to eagle or threat to health, and sense of control. So if any of those things aren't in all of our lives at some point, um, we're probably lying. But when we know that, we can deal with stress in a healthy way, whether it's prayer, meditation, and the next one is social connection and love, which is all about this sermon. Um, so connecting with loved ones in real time with real people, not just on screens. And then substances. We can very easily, with drugs, with um, medications, and with illicit drugs, numb out our systems. And this may feel good in the moment, but it's not helpful because what we're doing is we're dissociating from that pain and that suffering. I'll tell you a perfect example. I asked God for a break, and he didn't listen very well because I broke my arm a couple weeks ago. But I came out of surgery, and they had done a spinal block, so my whole arm was just like a dead fish. It was completely numb. It was wonderful. No pain at all. That night at 2 a.m., the nerves started waking up. And I woke up to this excruciating pain in my arm. I was like, okay, it's awake. But you know what I did? I had, I had uh, medications from the doctor I could have taken in an instant, and I would have. But I sat for just a moment, and I said, this is not worse than when I broke my arm. I wonder if I could just take a very light, like ibuprofen-type medication and sit with this pain. If it gets worse, I'll take medication. But what if I could just be with this pain? and love this pain, and thank it for telling me that my arm just had a major event. And I sat with that pain, and it was hard, but within an hour it subsided, and I was able to go back to sleep. And I think in our culture we so often run from pain. Do you know that leprosy is a disease where you lose limbs, fingers, arms, toes, because you have no sensation of pain? So you put your hand in the fire, you burn your fingers, and you cannot even feel it. And these are disfigured, they lose their noses, they lose their fingers, so pain is a gift. And our society is so pushed away pain that we've lost that connection to pain is a gift. Pain is a teacher. Pain is a blessing like Jacob wrestling with the angel and saying, bless me through this. So not that we have to suffer, but a little bit is okay because that's where God meets us. That's where he teaches us. And that's where he says, this sickness, this pain is not going to end in death. It will bring glory to God if you can be with it and if you can love it. And then lastly, uh, environmental toxins. And I touched on that. This is a whole lecture in and of itself. But some of you may be in an environment that is toxic, whether it's chemicals or toxic mold or heavy metals or other things. And this is affecting your brains and causing mental illness. Amazing. <clears throat> I want you to know we're using Dr. Jill as a resource in the years to come, especially as we're building programs for young people and, and even us as adults struggling with these things. And, we're, and this is going to be incorporated into the best care we can get from all of the different fields. I know people are very, very interested in all the things that you have to say. Where else can they find your teaching, your podcast, different, different, some of your favorite resources? 
Thank you. Um, you can go to my website, just jillcarnion.com. There's blogs and all kinds of free stuff on this topic. You're prolific. I mean, she's everywhere. CBS News, all these famous people's podcasts, they, they all want her. And it's all there in one place. And so you can find a number of resources that are helpful. Um, please, when Jill is here at church on Sundays, don't treat it like <laughs> the office. Let her enjoy her time here. But she's an incredible resource to us, as are many of our caregivers in the different fields. And we really appreciate what you had to share. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Thank you you for today. (laughs) All right, I'm going to end the service a little different. I'm just going to pray a prayer blessing on us, and then we'll be dismissed. And I can tell you, if you have kids in the children's ministry, they are tearing that building apart and waiting for you right now. So let's stand together, though. And receive a blessing if you feel comfortable. Just open your hip and 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 of the Father speaking over them. So I bless our church today in Jesus' name with more and more connection with you. Father, I pray as we experience your love that we might be able to turn our hearts, our lives, every part of us, every moment back to you in love. And so help us, Father, learn to love you more. And so I bless them with that. I also bless my friends with meaningful connection with others. More friendships, more intimacy in marriage, more connection between parents and children, among friends, New friends, I bless our church today with loving connection. I pray, Father, that we would take the model that you've given us, that we are meant to bring all of ourselves, our very best, and all of our moments into these relationships. So show us how to love better. And I bless this church today with more and more loving union. Lord, I pray out of those things that you would bring about flourishing, that you'd bring about health. And so lastly, we just ask for a blessing of health, mind, body, and soul. And we know, Lord, that um, not all of, there's not a single person that gets out of this life alive. There are many times that we pray for healing and it doesn't occur. But, Lord, what we do know is that someday you will restore all of us. And so we are grateful for that. But in the meantime, you've told us that we can ask. We can ask for healing. We can ask for help for our minds. We can ask for help with our souls and for our body. And so we pray in Jesus' name that you would bring about healing. I know there are people in the room right now that are journeying with people who are very, very sick. We pray for them as well. You know who they are and we lift them up and we ask for your healing in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that this would be a place where we remind each other what it means to be a person and who we are and that we'd remind each other that flourishing is found on the other side of love and so help us do that. We thank you for this time. We bless our church. We bless this moment, our families, our work, all that, that we get to entail and be a part of this week and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday. You guys are dismissed. And go grab your kids.